deeply learn of the death of a United Nations Department of Safety and Security staff member, an injury to another DSS staffer when their UN vehicle was struck as they traveled to the European hospital in Rafa this morning. The Secretary General condemns all attacks on UN personnel and calls for a full investigation. He sends his condolences to the family of the fallen staff member. With the conflict in Gaza continuing to take a heavy toll, not only on civilians, but also on humanitarian workers, the Secretary General reiterates his urgent appeal for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire and for the release of all hostages. That statement will be available to you shortly. Turning to the situation on the ground in Gaza, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says that ground incursions and heavy fighting continue to be reported in eastern Rafah, as well as Gaza City and the Jabalia refugee camp. The UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, reports that nearly 360,000 people have fled Rafah since the first evacuation order a week ago. Many of them have already been displaced multiple times over the past seven months. Meanwhile, evacuation orders issued on Saturday for northern Gaza amid ongoing Israeli bombardment there have resulted in the displacement of some 100,000 people so far. We remain deeply concerned about the lack of protection for civilians and the lack of safety for humanitarian operations. Civilians must be protected and have their basic needs met, whether they move or stay. Those who leave must have enough time to do so, as well as a safe route and a safe place to go. The UN continues to advocate for concrete assurances and actionable measures to facilitate the safe and secure movement of humanitarian cargo via all routes into and throughout the Gaza Strip. The Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reports that as of today, the Rafah crossing remains closed and there's a continued lack of safe and logistically viable access to the Karim Shalom crossing. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization reports that the incursion into Rafah has jeopardized the provision of health services, access to health care, and the delivery of life-saving supplies. WHO says that fuel shortages are also threatening the continuity of humanitarian efforts, saying that partners working on healthcare in Gaza require a minimum of 46,000 liters of fuel every day just for their operations. In case of an expanded military operation in, Gaza, in Rafah, WHO warns that there would be a heightened demand for fuel. Further on Gaza, the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Joyce Msuya, warned yesterday that the military offensive in Rafah spells further catastrophe for more than a million people who had been displaced to the city to escape fighting, disease, and hunger elsewhere. Ms. Musuya was speaking at an aid conference on Gaza hosted by Kuwait over the weekend. And yesterday, in Kuwait, the Secretary General met with Sheikh Michel al Ahmed al Jaber al Sabah, Emir of the State of Kuwait. Through the Emir, the Secretary General thanked Kuwait for its constructive and consistent role in promoting dialogue in the region and its contribution to humanitarian efforts, including about the situation in Gaza. The Secretary General also met with the newly appointed Minister, Prime Minister of Kuwait, Sheikh Ahmed Abdullah al Ahmed al Sabah. The Secretary General and the Prime Minister discussed issues of mutual interest, including the situation in Gaza and Sudan. The Secretary General thanked Kuwait for its support to the United Nations and contributions to peace in the region. Later in the day, the Secretary General was hosted for a working lunch with the Foreign Minister of, of Kuwait, Abdullah Ali al Yahya. While in Kuwait, the Secretary General also met with his special advisor, Dr. Abdullah Al-Matouk, who had just taken part in the United Nations Ninth Conference for Effective Partnership and Information Exchange for Better Humanitarian Action. They discussed the humanitarian situation in Gaza. And the Secretary General left for Oman on Monday afternoon. He should be uh, arriving there in the coming hours. The Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, is in London today, where she is taking part in the Google Zeitgeist event as a special guest speaker. In her remarks, she emphasized the importance of collaboration between the public and private sector to scale up innovative and scalable solutions for the Sustainable Development Goals. She also met with various stakeholders on the actions needed to accelerate the SDGs. The Deputy Secretary General will return to New York tonight. This morning, our Special Envoy for Yemen, Hans Grunberg, briefed the Security Council members on the situation in Yemen. Speaking from Aden, where he had discussions with various interlocutors, Mr. Grunberg said he is encouraged by the constructive environment in which these discussions were conducted. He added that despite the challenges, he still believes 
that a peaceful and just solution remains possible. For his part, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths, spoke about the worsening humanitarian situation in Yemen. He expressed concern over the cholera outbreak. The majority of cases are in Houthi-controlled areas, where hundreds of, new hundreds of new cases are reported every day. He underscored that we and our partners are taking urgent action to stem the spread of disease. Turning to Ukraine, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs tells us that due to the quickly deteriorating security situation in the Kharkiv region, local authorities, with the support of the UN and aid organizations, have evacuated nearly 6,000 people from the border area with the Russian Federation. The Kharkiv region has experienced several waves of attacks in recent days, which have led to more civilian deaths and injuries, including children. There's also been massive destruction of civilian infrastructure. That's also according to local authorities. Our humanitarian partners have provided support and transportation to people being evacuated, complementing the efforts of national rescue and municipal services. They distributed food, water, and hygiene kits, essential family supplies, arranged accommodation, and provided health and psychological support. Meanwhile, people in Donetsk and Sumy regions in the east and the north of the country also experienced attacks over the weekend and today. Local authorities and humanitarian partners on the ground said that homes and civilian infrastructure were damaged during the attacks. In April alone, the UN Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine documented more than 700 civilian casualties and 47 attacks on energy inf infrastructure across Ukraine. Turning to Afghanistan, you will have seen a statement we issued over the weekend in which the Secretary General said that he was saddened by the loss of life in flash floods in Baglan province in the northeast of Afghanistan. On the humanitarian side, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that search and rescue operations continue with the support of the Afghanistan Natural Disaster Management Authority. Casualty figures are expected to rise. Baglan, Badakhshan, and Thakar provinces are most affected, with Baglan accounting for 80% of the recorded deaths. Civilian infrastructure and agricultural land have also been damaged. We, along with our partners, are coordinating with the de facto authorities on the response. 14 joint assessment teams have been deployed, and humanitarian partners have identified available emergency stocks in the region. On the health front, UNICEF, the UN Population Fund, the World Health Organization, the International Organization for Migration, and our partners, deployed 27 mobile teams in Baglan, Badakhshan, and in Thakar provinces to support the response. WHO disp dis dispatched seven tons of me medicine and med medical supplies, including trauma and primary health care kits. Health partners also provided dozens of kits for pneumonia, acute watery diarrhea, malnutrition, and trauma. The World Food Program dispatched more than 50,000 tons of food in Baglan province. Turning to Sudan, the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths, warned that Sudan is at a tipping point amid more alarming reports from El Fasher, the capital of North Darfur. In posts on social media, Mr. Griffiths said that the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has told the parties how they should protect civilians from this carnage, and the UN now expects them to do what the world and international humanitarian law expect. He warned that countless lives are at stake in El Fasher, which is home to some 800,000 civilians. Healthcare in the city is already coming under threat, and medical supplies are running dangerously low in the southern hospital. In the Central African Republic, a conference is being held today in the capital, Bangui, to find sustainable solutions to reduce the insecurity and violence associated with the seasonal migration of cattle and people, also known as transhumance. The conference is organized by the Central African authorities in partnership with our peacekeeping mission, MINUSCA, and includes representatives from the government, UN colleagues, as well as local leaders from the prefectures where the seasonal migration takes place. The head of our peacekeeping mission, Valentin Rugwabisa, recalled that this topic is one of the five specific issues set out in the peace agreement, which underlined the need for an efficient and equitable management system for transhumance to make it a secure, peaceful, and prosperous activity. In Haiti, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs warns that people in some neighborhoods of the capital, Port-au-Prince, are extremely vulnerable with armed groups continuing to perpetrate coordinated attacks. Last Friday, the, com the commune of Gressier, south of Port-au-Prince, was attacked and several houses were set on fire. According to local authorities, an unknown number of residents were forced to flee. Our partners are conducting assessments both in Gressier and in, neighbor in nearby areas where people fled. 
There are currently 362,000 internally displaced people, half of them children, in the country, with 160,000 of them in the metropolitan area of Port-au-Prince. According to the International Organization for Migration, between the 8th of March and the 9th of April, some 95,000 people fled the capital, 60% of them to the southern departments. Despite the volatile situation, humanitarian organizations continue to provide emergency assistance to thousands of people in the capital and other areas of the country. Since the 1st of March, the World Food Program has helped more than 800,000 people across the country through its school feeding, emergency, and resilience programs. The agency has distributed more than 825,000 meals to over 95,000 displaced people in the Port-au-Prince metropolitan zone. The UN Office on Drugs and Crime today released the third edition of its World Wildlife Crime Report, which says that wildlife trafficking has not been substantially reduced despite two decades of concerted action. According to the report, seizures during the period between 2015 and 2021 indicated an illegal trade in 162 countries and territories, affecting around 4,000 plant and animal species. Wildlife crime is interconnected with the activities of large and powerful organized crime groups operating in some of the world's most fragile and diverse ecosystems, from the Amazon to the Golden Triangle. UNODC said that to tackle wildlife crime, more consistent enforcement to tackle both supply and uh, demand, effective implementation of legislation, and stronger monitoring and research are needed. The full report is online. And do we have any questions? Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you, Farhan. A couple of follow-ups on the incident with the Department of Safety and Security um, employees. Uh, first, um, was um, do we know how serious the injuries are of the man who was injured? We're hopeful for a recovery. <laughs> Uh, at this point, uh, we are in the process of informing, uh, you know, the relevant governments and the relevant family members. So I wouldn't share any names or nationalities. And is there any in indication of? Um, I think you said they were heading to a hospital. Do we yes. know why they were heading to a hospital? Uh, well, the. As part of their regular work, they go to different locations to, to assess security conditions. And this was the European hospital in Rafa. Uh, yes, Amelie. Still uh, follow up on that. Uh, th what you said means that they are not Palestinians. Uh, I believe that they are international staff. But, okay. uh, but um, uh, again, I, I'm not, uh, I don't have the nationalities okay. to share. Uh, do you, I mean, you said their vehicle was struck. Do you know by what? I mean, what, what happened? No, the, the, this happened fairly recently. We're still uh, accumulating details. We expect to get uh, reports, uh, including from, uh, from uh, the relevant uh, authorities. And last, last one, do you have, uh, with this new casualty, uh, the, the latest toll of the number of UN personnel killed in Gaza since the 7th of October? Uh, well, this this adds one more uh, person. Uh, as, as it is, we have, I believe, uh, close to uh, uh, around 190 uh, UN personnel who have been casualties, most of them uh, national staff of the UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA. Uh, yes, yeah, Sherwin. Farhan, uh, what is the UN doing to seek justice for the almost 200 UN staff that were killed in the war? What is the process the UN now follows? Staff members being killed by a strike in Gaza. Uh, how do you seek justice for your staff member? Oh, in, in all cases, we we're, are going to set up uh, m measures for accountability. A lot of that, as you know, requires ultimately for an end to the conflict so that we can work these out. But we will be in, in uh, working with the authorities on the ground uh, to, to get restitution for all of those who have been killed. Um, yes, Abdul Hamid? Thank you, Farhan. I have a few questions. First, uh, UNRWA issued a statement uh, about being accused of hiding hostages. And they said, I think the word they used is absurd or crazy or something. Are you aware of this uh, new Israeli uh, accusation against UNRWA? Uh, yes. Uh, and and uh, uh, 
again, uh, what uh, the UN Relief and Works Agency uh, says is something we, we support. Obviously, they are doing their work uh, professionally under extremely arduous circumstances, and, and we need to appreciate uh, the work that they're doing. And the main office in Jerusalem has been set on fire twice. Mm -hmm. Is the UN doing anything? And, you know, Lazzarini decided yeah. to close the office. So yeah. what is the next step? Well, you'll have seen what we said uh, last Friday about this, uh, this incident. Uh, certainly, this was something that was outrageous. Uh, and uh, Mr. Lazzarini took the decision uh, to close the compound until our security can be, uh, can be uh, uh, ensured. Uh, and uh, this is something we stand firm on. Uh, obviously, the security of, of UN staff as they go about their work has to be ensured by all host countries everywhere. Can I have more? Uh, one more? Uh, yes, one more, and then we'll go around. Okay. Yeah, the number of uh, bodies recovered from those mass graves now reached 525. New mass graves had been discovered also in the Shifa compound. Uh, and I've been asking again and again, mm -hmm. and you, the SG said, should be investigating. Yeah. W where we go from here? I mean, we keep uh, calling for investigation. Who, who to investigate? The Israeli will investigate themselves? We have insisted on a credible investigation. Obviously, as the Secretary General himself has said, that would need to be independent, and we, we need to see what uh, format that will take. Benno? Thank you. A um, few more follow-ups to the incident in Gaza. Um, were these two people part of a larger convoy? Uh, I don't have the full details of... of, of uh, whether this was part of a, a large convoy or not. I, I believe it was in, mm -hmm. in a convoy that was moving, and this was the DSS vehicle that was hit. And, okay, and can you tell me, was the car they moved in marked with the uh, UN? Yeah, all, all, all vehicles were UN-marked vehicles, yes. Uh, yes, please. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, with regard to the uh, WHO uh, statement, and they say that... Uh, the current situation impacts the delivery of healthcare service, etc. In previous statements, WHO said that the uh, medical infrastructure in Gaza is totally destroyed. In addition to other reports about epidemics, uh, fear of epidemics such as cholera, and even some they went uh, even to the stage of uh, fears of uh, plague. Can we have Dr. Tedros from the WHO uh, to have a briefing with us, whether virtually or in person, to clarify and give an uh, exact and precise evaluation uh, of his organization to the medical and health situation in Gaza? Well, I don't know whether it will be Dr. Tedros himself, but we'll ask uh, the World Health Organization whether uh, one of their uh, uh, senior people dealing with Gaza can can do a briefing with you. So we'll try to set that up. Uh, yes, Gabriel. Thanks, Farhan. There's some reporting that's come out that says, quote, the UN has halved, halved the number of casualties. Halved, halved. yes. Has, it's, a, it's a hard word to say. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, though, Yes, right? I, I do know. Cut in half. Cut in half, thank you. Uh, the the uh, casualties from Gaza, is that true? Uh, it, it's, it's not quite the case, no. Um, what I can tell you is this. The overall number of fatalities that's been tallied by the Ministry of Health in Gaza, which is our counterpart on dealing with uh, the, the death tolls, mm -hmm. that number remains unchanged, and it's at more than 35,000 people since, the, uh, since October 7th. What's changed is the Ministry of Health in Gaza has updated the breakdown of fatalities for whom mm -hmm. full details have been documented. So... What they mm -hmm. pu recently published was uh, that they uh, gave figures for 24,686 out of, uh, out of 34,622 overall fatalities recorded in Gaza. And those 24,686 people are the ones for whom full details have been documented. In other words, people who have been fully identified. Those, out of those, then, out of that smaller number, that subset, of identified bodies, you have 7,797 children, 4,959 women, 1,924 elderly, and 10,006 men. 
And the Ministry of Health uh, says that the documentation process of fully identifying details of the casualties is ongoing. Uh, meanwhile, as, as you can see if you do the math, that there's about uh, another 10,000 plus uh, bodies who still have to be fully identified. And so then the details of those which of those are children, which of those are women, that will be reestablished once the full identification process is complete. We, our teams in Gaza, are unable to un independently verify these figures given the situation on the ground and the continuing combat and the sheer number of fatalities. And so we uh, cite the Ministry of Health as the source for our figures. And do you have any reason to believe that the Ministry of Health numbers are incorrect based on the years that the UN has worked with the Ministry of Health of Gaza? Uh, unfortunately, we have the sad experience of coordinating with the Ministry of Health on casualty figures every few years for uh, large ca mass casualty incidents in Gaza. And in past, uh, past times, uh, their figures have proven to be generally accurate. Uh, yes, Deshi. Yeah, uh, follow up on the on the incident that happened in the on, on the convoy. You said it's a uh, one death of international stuff. Uh, how how many international uh, staff of the UN were killed uh, after seventh of October in Gaza? Uh, I'm. He's not I've, the first one. I'm not aware. I'm not aware of a previous. Uh, I'm not aware of a previous international so staff casualty the first among one. the UN. As you know, there were international casualties uh, involving workers for the World Central Kitchen. Yes. Uh, but uh, but of UN staff, I believe I've I've not been previously aware of. The this international could casualty. be the first international staff. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I mean, my colleagues can correct me if if I've missed one. Okay. Uh, I I have. I have a couple of other questions. Yeah. Uh, last week we talked we, we talked a lot about the 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 aid convoy, the, the the difficulties in in the two border crossings and the third one areas. Do you have any update? Does the UN have any new humanitarian deliveries into Gaza through the all three crossings, including fuels? Uh, yeah. As as I mentioned at the start of this briefing. Uh, there's still no uh, no uh, traffic of humanitarian goods uh, going through the Rafah crossing, which is closed, and there's still a lack of safe and logistically viable access to the Karem Shalom crossing. So, uh, and we, we're trying to get things, including through the Ares crossing, but uh, but the amount of stuff traveling has been very small the, uh, uh, in recent days. The what is the situation of the fuel? For, for, for UN agencies inside Gaza? At this stage, we're, we're rationing fuel. I believe that there was a small amount of fuel that, uh, that was able to arrive over the weekend. So, so we're, not, we're not in a shutdown mode. Small but uh, but, but we, are, we are very low of fuel. Uh, yes, behind Abdel Hamid, please. Yeah. Yes, you, you haven't had a chance yet. It's Georgia from Athens and Cyprus News Agency. Hello. Thank you for our hand. Thanks. Are there any updates in the wake of Mrs. Olguin's visit to Cyprus? What will the next steps be? She said that she will compile a report on the results of your contacts with the two sides. So what will this report contain? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, well, as you know, the, uh, the special uh, envoy, Ms. Olguin, uh, will, uh, will also uh, brief the council and, and keep them informed about her work. So, uh, so that will be the next update you'll get about, uh, about the visits that she's had. Uh, Pam? Thanks, Marhan. On uh, the Brazil front, on the floods, there's yeah. been an increase, particularly in the south as of this morning, how much has the UN been able to get in and what are the efforts to help? Thank you. Uh, I believe we gave an update um, last Friday about our efforts, and, and so we are coordinating, and we have been doing some efforts on the ground in, in, in conjunction with uh, the Brazilian authorities. I'll see whether we can get a further update this week. Yes, please. According to some news stories, uh, the Iraq's Prime Minister, Mr. Sudani, has requested UN Secretary General to permanently end the mandate of the United Nations assistance for Iraq by end of 2025. So the question is, has Secretary General received a, such a letter? And if yes, uh, what he thinks about this request? Thank you. Uh, yeah, we, we in fact did receive a letter from the Prime Minister of Iraq last Thursday about the mandate of, of the UN assistance mission for Iraq. And we are, we've transmitted that letter to the President of the Security Council. 
ultimately, as you know, our mandates are set by the Security Council, and it will be the decision of the Security Council um, to, uh, to determine the future of the mission. Now, we have been doing work in Iraq uh, since 2003. And, uh, and as you know, uh, last year, we were requested by the Security Council to conduct uh, an independent strategic review of UNAMI. And, uh, and uh, on the 24th of March of this year, the Secretary General reported back to the Council on the outcome of the independent strategic review. So the Council can take into account uh, the results of the strategic review uh, as it determines uh, the next uh, mandate of UNAMI. The current mandate, as you know, expires at the end of this month, and we'll uh, see uh, how they proceed. But we trust that council members and the Iraqi government will now find the best way forward. And, uh, and uh, as they do that, that they'll take into uh, consideration the recommendations by the Independent Strategic Review. Uh, yes, in the back. Thank you, Mr. Farhan. I'm Camelia from the Independent Persian. Uh, Mr. Farhan, yesterday, Secretary of State Antony Blinken told the ABC, which Israel's attack on Rafah will not destroy Hamas. Based on this comment, what is the United Nations position? And I would like to know when was the last time the Secretary General spoke with President Biden. Thank you. Uh, he has spoken with him intermittently. I, I don't have the last time, but we have been in touch with our U.S. counterparts on a very regular basis, including, by the way, through the U.S. mission here at the United Nations. And so we, we remain in, in close contact with, uh, with the U.S. Sorry, and Secretary Blinken's comment about Rafa? Uh, our, our comments on Rafa, as you know, uh, uh, are, are unchanged, and we've warned against uh, any offensive in Rafa. And so, uh, and so we appreciate efforts by other countries to also warn about the, the adverse impact of an operation on Rafa. Uh, OK, uh, Edie and Abdulhamid again. Um, thank you, Farhan. Uh, two follow-ups. First. Um, on the strategic review on Iraq, can we get any details on what the review actually uh, found or is recommending? And then I have one more question. Yeah, I mean, obviously the U.S., uh, the U United Nations doesn't intend to stay in countries indefinitely. So what we try to do is devise ways that are essentially conditions-backed plans to withdraw our presence. And so this is what uh, the strategic review was, uh, was working on. Um, so this was a report that the, that, uh, the uh, Secretary General sent back to the Security Council on the 24th of March. And so, so now they're, they're evaluating it. We'll see uh, whether uh, the, the chair of that strategic, strategic review, our old friend Volker Perthes, uh, is willing to talk at, at, at some point to the press about it. And going back to what you said about the Secretary General's uh, meeting in, meetings in Kuwait, um, you talked about an aid conference that he attended was, I believe. Uh, he did not attend that conference. Uh, he delivered a video message to the conference. Uh, that's why I, I just told you about his meetings with Kuwaiti officials. So that's what he was doing at the time. What, what was... Who were they um, raising money for, and do we know how much money was raised? Uh, I, well, it, it was Kuwait who organized that conference, and I believe they, they can tell you about the figures. Uh, but uh, we had sent, uh, as I had pointed out, uh, our assistant secretary general uh, for OCHA, Joyce Msuya, and she was there. Uh, uh, we quoted her here. And like I said, the secretary general also contributed a video message to that. Uh, yes, yes Abdul Hamid, and then Sharif. Follow up to Edith's question. Mm -hmm. Did the Secretary General discuss the financial crisis of UNRWA with the Kuwaiti officials and Omani officials as well? Uh, he's been discussing the needs of the UN Relief and Works Agency with uh, a wide number of interlocutors. So, so he does this as a regular feature of, of his meetings yeah. uh, with, uh, with different leaders. My second question. Today, Adnan Abu Hasna, the media advisor of UNRWA in Gaza, said the following that within 24 hours we'll run out of fuel and within 72 hours we'll run out of food if Rafah crossing continues to be closed. So what is the UN 
the, 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 we, we are in touch with our counterparts, uh, we're uh, including our Israeli counterparts, and we're trying to get fuel in. We've made it very clear the need for fuel for our basic operations. No one should be surprised if, because of a lack of fuel, we have to shut things down, and we want to avoid getting to that point, and we've made that very clear. Uh, by the way, um, uh, I have the confirmation this is, in fact, the first international UN casualty. Uh, Sharife. Warren, I wanted to ask you if you have a comment on um, the videos that are depicting settlers in the West Bank attacking aid convoys and emptying out um, the aid materials uh, that are heading to Gaza. Uh, well, this is, this is appalling. Uh, obviously, there should be no attacks on humanitarian convoys anywhere, and we stand firmly against them. And of course, you know our position on settlements. Uh, I believe online we actually have a question from Iftikhar. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, do you have an update on the casualty figures uh, in the floods in Afghanistan? And does the UN mission have resources to meet the situation? Uh, we don't. Uh, yeah, we haven't been tracking the figures uh, in Afghanistan. Those were provided uh, uh, by the the authorities, the relevant authorities uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we, we believe that uh, there have been several hundreds, uh, uh, several, several hundreds of people reported dead in the floods so far, but, but we will get that information from our uh, Afghanistan counterparts. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel? Thank you, Farhan. Uh, there's video circulating on social media purporting to show the UN vehicle that was attacked in this incident. Do you know of this video that's circulating, and can you confirm that that's the incident? Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to confirm that at this stage. Uh, we're, we're getting information uh, uh, and trying to get reports, uh, including from uh, the, the parties on the ground, to see what their own actions have been. So I wouldn't have a narrative ready at this stage. Uh, Amelie. I mean, sorry, sorry, just to follow up on that again. Uh, at the beginning, you said you believe they are international staff. Now you say it is the first international yeah, staff. Yes, so yes, they are. They, they you're are, they sure are, they are international they, staff? They are international. Ca uh, they are. They are international casualties. Yes, okay. they, they are international staff. <laughs> I, I don't have nationalities to share with so, you, okay. but they are not Palestinian. Yes, Benno. And just to double check, because we talked about the wording uh, that you said it was struck. Um, is it fair to characterize this as an attack? Yes. Uh, and if we're and if that's it, uh, then I shall see you all tomorrow. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>